Well, on this program, geez, it seems like it was a year ago. I'm not sure exactly when it was. Kevin Camps was on, and he was talking about how, you know, the groundwater around Fukushima is now at risk. Well, apparently that has come to pass. Kevin Camps of Beyond Nuclear, he is the nuclear waste watchdog at beyondnuclear.org. Kevin, welcome back to the program. Hi, Tom. Thanks for having me. Great to have you with us. Uh, what's what's the current state of the, you know, what's going on? This I, I saw this, this uh, headline, this Reuters story, Japan finds highly toxic strontium-90 in Fukushima groundwater. What does this mean? Well, it's probably the biggest crisis since the beginning of this nuclear catastrophe over two years ago in March of 2011. It's the fact that they continually have to use large amounts of water to keep the molten cores cool on a perpetual basis into the future. They use something like 400 tons of water per day to cool the molten cores, and so they have to store that water because it's contaminated with radioactivity. And there's an equal amount of water that is simply flooding into the basement levels of this destroyed nuclear power plant from the groundwater, which then picks up radioactive contamination. Mm. So about 800 tons of water per day is becoming radioactively contaminated. It all has to be stored. And so they've filled all the areas of the site with these water storage tanks. And obviously it is leaking because radioactive strontium, which is a a seeker of bone in the human body, as well as radioactive tritium, which goes everywhere in the human body, have been found at very high levels, very close to the Pacific shore, just within 100 feet of the Pacific Ocean at the site. Wow. And uh, by seeker of bone, you mean it gets in your bones and it would cause, over time, bone cancer? Yeah, it is carcinogenic. The body mistakes radioactive strontium-90 for calcium, so it just embeds in the human bone. It can cause bone cancer. Oh, it can wow. cause leukemia. The same way the body mistakes radioactive cesium for potassium and, and embeds it in muscles like the heart. Yeah, exactly. And so at Chernobyl, the worst culprits that escaped in that catastrophe were radioactive cesium and strontium. They both have a 30-year half-life so you got to multiply by at least 10, so that's 300 years of hazard. To be safer, uh, 600 years of hazard. And once it gets into the ocean, it then reconcentrates. It doesn't dilute. It reconcentrates in the food chain, and humans are at the top of the, of the food chain. Right, and, to, and to, to say that in plain English, the, the little tiny plants, the algae absorb it, and then the algae get eaten by the little fish, and the little fish get eaten by the medium-sized fish, and the medium-sized fish get eaten by the big fish. And by the time you got a big fish like a tuna being hauled up on board, um, you've got probably tons and tons and tons of algae that absorb strontium that have been, you know, worked their way through the bodies of all these fish that have made this giant carnivorous fish. And then we eat it. That's Is that right. right? And, uh, yeah, that's exactly right. It's called bioconcentration. And uh, the other element I mentioned, radioactive hydrogen, which is called tritium, that goes everywhere in the human body, right down to the DNA level where it does its damage. And mm-hmm. what's really incredible is, whereas Tokyo Electric Power Company is trying to filter out some of the radioactivity from the contaminated water, you cannot filter out tritium because it is water. It's radioactive hydrogen. So that simply is left behind, even if the filtering systems work, which they're not. And the big question is, where does the tritiated water go Tokyo Electric would like to just dump it in the ocean intentionally, and the fishermen along the coast are not letting that happen. What is the lifespan of tritium? I'm sorry? What is the half-life for tritium? It's 12.3 years, so that's about 120 years, if not 250 years of hazard. Wow. And and if it's if it's radioactive hydrogen, hydrogen is... is, is which, I always mix up helium and hydrogen. Which one is... Is it one or two... Um, you know, protons, neutrons, and electrons. Yeah, hydrogen is number one on the periodic table. Number one. So it has uh, a single proton. and uh, So if it's made radioactive, has, what does it have? Uh, a sec- neutron, and then tritium has two neutrons, so it's a three-particle nucleus in the hydrogen atom. So two neutrons, one proton, one electron. Yeah. And, and it takes uh, 12 and a half years for that extra neutron to discharge itself, basically. Yeah, and, you know, it's... Uh, very powerful at that level in the DNA or in your cells or in your tissues. That's where it does its damage. Yeah, a neutron flying around. Isn't that, is that, a, is that what's called an alpha particle? Pardon my uh, high school science questions here. It's been a long time since I studied this. Well, you got alpha particles, you got gamma radiation, you got uh, neutron radiation from an ongoing chain reaction, and uh, 
Yeah, to be honest with you, we have another expert who handles that stuff. He would know that stuff. So it's probably the neutron radiation because it's a neutron. So, you know, but whatever. Okay. So that's that's what's going on with that. Um, Actually, the tritium uh, is a, it's a beta emission, and it's uh, considered a low beta emission, but when you get it into your most intimate DNA molecules, right. that's, that's... Yeah, because it's going to go anywhere in your body that water would, and your body's like 90, 98% water or something, so... Yeah, and there's a phenomenon called organically bound tritium where uh, it sticks around for a very long time. You know, some of the tritium does get excreted, you know, in urine and such, but some of it binds in your in your tissues and it sticks around and does prolong damage. So what's the future? I mean, TEPCO here, you're talking 800 tons of water a day to keep these cores from melting down and going nuclear. And, uh, you know, where are they getting that water from? Where's that water going to go? How can they sustain this for more than, I mean, they've been doing it for two years now. That's a mind-boggling amount of water. Where are they going to put all this? Well, there's been some amazing photos run in the New York Times, for example, that shows that the entire site is being covered in these giant steel tanks. They're, they're very large size, and there's thousands of them at this point. Really? They're holding immense amounts of water. We're talking hundreds of thousands of tons of water in these tanks, which are leaking, unfortunately. That's where some of this contamination is coming from. So there's, there's, I mean, it, it sounds like there's no end game here. There's no, there's no, there's no, I, I, you know, they, is there, I mean, at, at Chernobyl, they covered the cores in concrete and they just said, okay, we're going to let, let it cook. All right, can they do that at Fukushima? Is there, what, is there any, is there any way to put an end to this? You know, it's really incredible. They have been criticized, Tokyo Electric has, for very short term thinking. They're taking things like one day at a time, but of course, this is a, decades-long, if not centuries-long, crisis that they're facing. So Mm -hmm. very little to no long-term planning. One of the things that happened at Chernobyl right away was uh, liquid nitrogen was used to freeze the ground so that groundwater, for example, couldn't flow through the melted-down reactor core site. And Hmm. at Fukushima Daiichi, they have not done that. And they're now talking about it. We're two, two and a half years into this crisis and they're just now talking about perhaps we should freeze the ground to prevent groundwater from flowing through and picking up radioactivity. So long-term scenario, uh, Tokyo Electric certainly doesn't know what to do. They're showing that by their actions. Wow. Now, I hear from a friend of mine who's Japanese, lives in Japan, that um, the Japanese people are not... That there's, you know, there's a small subset who are very freaked out about this, but by and large, the level of freakout has decreased somewhat because of all these assurances from TEPCO and the government. Is that consistent with what you understand? Well, I think there's evidence that, you know, something major has changed in the Japanese population. Certainly there have been anti-nuclear activists hard at work for decades into the past, but now, you know, a sure sign of the level of concern is that 48 of the 50 still operable reactors in Japan are simply shut down. Right. Because local populations will not let them restart. And in fact, there's a redoubled effort to get the two operating reactors shut down because of earthquake risks. Uh huh. And, uh, well, that, well, that's good news. Any chance of that happening in the United States? Not the earthquake risk, we all know that. But, you know, shutting down our nuclear plants? Well, it's been an amazing year. Four atomic reactors have shut down this year in the United States one in Florida, one in Wisconsin, and then most recently, about two weeks ago, at San Onofre. California, two reactors shut down. That's the most of any year in U.S. history, actually. And there's more dominoes ready to fall. That's great. And this is stuff you guys at Beyond Nuclear have been working on. Yeah, and the grassroots movement across the country. Good on you. Uh, people can get, you, uh, y'all can get more information at beyondnuclear.org. Kevin Camps, the nuclear waste watchdog at Beyond Nuclear. Kevin, great talking with you. You too, Tom. Thank Thanks you. for the update. It's, it's always great talking with you. It's always very informative. We'll be back 15 minutes past the hour.